Hello, good evening. Good evening or good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, welcome. So, um, yeah, I hope everything is okay with the sound, with the image. And um, see many familiar names. Nice to see you again. <clears throat> good. <laughs> Yes, I'm not mentioning any names because this is also on YouTube. Uh, and um, so if, um, yeah, if you can't see the whole uh, presentation or if you missed the previous pre presentations, so they are still available on YouTube. I just posted the link. So on the uh, YouTube channel of World Virtual Tours, you can find the previous presentations and also this one. Uh, obviously, without the chat and without, you know, the written uh, comments. And um, so I see some has, have been to Italy. <laughs> Wait, let me see, because now I can't see the chat anymore. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and it's nice to see the whole world present. <coughs> So somebody was in Siena last week. I was there too. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, okay, so one minute to go and then we'll start. Snow in Toronto. No, it has been cold for a few days, but now it's less cold again. So, um, yeah, but d d winter is definitely approaching. So let me see. Okay, so let me start then. Um, welcome, welcome everybody, welcome here in um, on World Virtual Tours. And um, so my name is Patrizia, and I'm an uh, art historian and also archaeologist. And uh, I live in central Italy, in the region of Umbria, somewhere in the hills, which is not very difficult if you know that 70% of Umbria are hills and 30% are mountains. But I live not very far from the border with Tuscany. And so, you know, I also do tours in Tuscany. Last Saturday, I was in Siena. You know, I did a live walking tour. Uh, and so now this is the fourth a presentation of the series of uh, frescoes, so Renaissance frescoes, but not the Sistine Chapel or not the Stanze of Raffaello. Uh, they were also part of a presentation by my colleague, uh, Lily, uh, who does also a lot of um, presentations and lessons here in the Free Academy of World Virtual Tours. And so this is the fourth one. Uh, if you missed the three previous ones, so they are still available on the uh, YouTube channel of World Virtual Tours for a certain time. Um, I mean, not forever, but you know, just for a few weeks. And um, then, um, yeah, so let's um, start. Let's start then just uh, with the presentation. So now, I'm going to close the chat and I will reopen it again at the end. And there is a lot to tell. <laughs> oh, yes, I have a big clock on the left and the right and so on. But, you know, I, I always you know, want to tell probably too much. Uh, but uh, so I will take your questions at the uh, end. So, OK, so I think I saw everything here and now I'm closing here. Closing the chat. <clears throat> Where is it? Oh, okay, now. Okay. okay, so, and now I'm going to share my screen and uh, start. So, sound on. Okay. And so, yes, this is, of course, part of the Free Academy course, Masterpieces of the Italian Renaissance. And uh, so we did some, and there are, oh, it was very difficult to choose, you know. And so um, in January, I already announced that in January, I will do another uh, series, um, but just about uh, Assisi. 
you know, Assisi and the frescoes in the Basilica and the story of Assisi, the history of Assisi and the story of St. Francis of Assisi. And so the fourth, <clears throat> the fourth lesson or the fourth presentation of that series in Assisi in January will be a live walking tour inside the St. Francis Basilica. I got a special permission because it's a papal basilica. Uh, but so I got a special authorization. So in January, keep posted. It's not on the website yet, but <clears throat> I will do that in January. And so, uh, of course, you know, this is all based on donations. So um, that's what keeps us going. <laughs> and so creating also these presentations because the presentation itself is, uh, you know, is an hour. And of course, you know, um, I regularly go on these spots and so on, but putting together a presentation, it's quite some um, quite some hours of work. And so now I'm going to take you to Tuscany. So here you see a map of Italy and the red area is of course Tuscany. And um, uh, here we are in Siena. So I was there last Saturday, if you saw it. And um, so in Siena, this is the magnificent Piazza del Campo, you know, the medieval square. You can see the Palazzo Publico, the town hall. Also inside, there are some uh, incredible frescoes. And um, I probably also in general, I will do something about that too. Uh, so you see, there's <laughs> so much material. And then, um, yeah, this is seen from above, this magnificent square, which is not a square, but has the shape of a shell or it has the shape of a fan. It's divided into nine wedges as you can see you know there are these gray stones that divide the square in nine wedges and um, that is of course a reference to the government of the nine an incredible um, uh, um, public administration uh, you know around so the end of the 13th and the first half of the 14th century but we are now going to the cathedral of Siena and so um, yeah the cathedral is also a medieval cathedral so they started in the 13th century and then they continued in the 14th century I mean there's a lot to talk about that but we are going inside the cathedral um, this is the interior here you can see also the magnificent pavement um, and um, yeah so we have to go now in the left hand aisle so you see there are three aisles, three naves. And so the left-hand aisle already, you can see in between the columns, you can see a kind of marble monument. And that marble monument is an altar in reality. And it's the altar for the Piccolomini family. And we will talk quite a bit about this Piccolomini family. So this is the altar that I'm talking about. Um, so this is a marble altar that was commissioned by uh, Francesco Piccolomini. Francesco Piccolomini, he was the nephew of Pope Pius II. And Pope Pius II was also a member of this Piccolomini family. And we're going to talk about his life because that's what these frescoes uh, of um, you know, today's presentations are about. But so this altar uh, dates back to the 1480s. So it's, uh, you know, quite a classical Renaissance uh, altar. But, you know, at a certain point, Francesco, uh, you know, Piccolomini, he um, commissioned uh, Michelangelo. So he asked Michelangelo to make 15 statues for this um Altar. So the altar already existed, but so he asked Michelangelo. Michelangelo only made four of the 15 statues because then Francesco Piccolomini, he died. And then, well, in the end, he only made um, four of those. But just next door, so if you're standing in front of this altar in the left-hand aisle, on the right-hand side, just right-hand side of this altar, there is this. So this is not really an altar. This is a wall a wall um, with, you know, the lower part is uh, also a marble uh, sculpture. And then above, you can just see a little bit of a big fresco, big painting. I'm going to show you just in a second. And then you see this little door. Look at the people behind the door. So the door, so very tall people, I think they have to duck. Um, I don't, <laughs> but um, now I'm wondering because it's really a small door, a small entrance. And so when you go inside, really people who don't know, who don't know what's behind the door, um, I mean, no, nothing can prepare them for, for what is, is behind it if you don't know it in advance. So above the door, we can see the coat of arms uh, of the Piccolomini. So it's a blue cross with five uh, moon crescents. 
So you you see it every, when you walk around in Siena, you know you see it everywhere, and uh, you can see above this coat of arms there is the red uh, head of a cardinal. So this is a cardinal's head. So who was the cardinal who commissioned this? Um, you know the, the 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 library which is behind the door. So that was this Francesco, you no know, Francesco Piccolomini, the nephew of Pope Pius the second. So um, this Piccolomini family was, um, you know, was an important banker's family in Siena. But in the beginning of the 15th century, this Piccolomini family got in trouble with another family. I mean, they were exiled. And so the Piccolomini family, so at least the father, you know, father Silvio Piccolomini, he moves with his wife to an estate in the countryside. And that is an estate, was an estate near Corsignano. Corsignano was just a little village. There were some farms around. There was this, this agricultural estate of the Piccolomini family. And that's where, you know, then uh, Silvio Piccolomini has now 18 children, yes, 18 children. And the firstborn was Enea Silvio. And Enea Silvio, he will become Pope Pius II. And when he becomes Pope Pius II, one of the first thing he does is to appoint his nephew, Francesco Piccolomini, to cardinal. So, um, <laughs> and this is the, the, the coat of arms we're talking about. So this is the coat of arms of Cardinal Francesco Piccolomini. So the word nepotism, you know, nepotism comes literally from nepos. And nepos, the word nepos, Greek word nepos, is nephew. Um, so the Pope appointed his nephew. And he was, he was, um, I don't know, he was really the first one, but, you know, we talk about nepotism uh, from this Pope onwards. Um, from this Pope onwards, you know, the Renaissance Popes, what they did, you know, was the first thing they did often was, you know, to give all their family members nice jobs. Anyway, this is the coat of arms of this Francesco Piccolomini. And I couldn't um, make it clearer, but you see in, uh, so the coat of arms is in a kind of arch and left and right of this arch, you can see there's an animal. There's an animal, that's a lamb. And the lamb is uh, also um, part of the coat of arms of the, not of the Piccolomini family, um, but of the Piccolomini Todeschini family, because in reality, this Francesco, this Cardinal Francesco Piccolomini, his complete name was Francesco Todeschini Piccolomini. He was a nephew, but, you know, um, he was a nephew. Um, and, um, yeah, so he... Um, was he was allowed to take the name of Piccolomini because you know his mother was the sister of the Pope, and so but uh, you know their her her sons were allowed to take over the name of Piccolomini, and um, yes, yeah, so this is um, a little painting from the 15th century where you can see the Pope Pius II who anoints or who crowns his or he gives the cardinal's head to his nephew. So that was registered. So this is from the archives in Siena. And this is the painting, which is above the entrance of the library. So before we enter, I just wanted to show you briefly this, because this was um, a painting. So this is not inside, but it's outside. It's just above the entrance door. I've just shown you. You see here, you can see the, the, the bottom part of that, that painting, because that you know, a lot of people say it's a bit awkward. So you have this kind of marble entrance and then you have this painting above. Well, it was not in the original plans of this library because Cardinal Francesco Todeschini Piccolomini, he will commission the library. He will also commission the paintings in the library. So we're going to talk about that um, just in a minute. <laughs> um, but um, then what happens is that this cardinal, he becomes Pope as well. He will become Pope as well. And he will take the name of Pius III. You know, Pius III to honor, of course, his uncle Pius II. And so that was not in the original plan. So when he commissioned the library, he was still a cardinal. I mean, he, he couldn't, he really didn't have, I mean, didn't have a clue that he would become a Pope. And so that was added. So this painting was added, of course, yeah, after he had become Pope. And so, um, it's a bit different from the rest of the library that you can see, but still attributed to, not attributed, this is still 
you know, it's not attribute because it's certain, that is from um, Pintorico, so the same painter who painted also the interior of the library that we're going to see. <laughs> but um, so here you can see, is there a detail of the crowning? No. So here you can see the crowning, uh, the crowning of this Pope Pius III. But you know, he was Pope for only 28 days. days. So um, yeah, I mean, wasn't so you know in in this painting they couldn't really you know say a lot about all his achievements or so on so uh, you know because he was pope for only 28 days um and um here you can see some details and also you know this this painting is a bit different from the colors so um it's not really sure how fast he painted uh, this but it has the elements of pintoricchio so very very colorful and very very uh, narrative and very detailed. So, you know, uh, if Pintoricchio hadn't been a painter, he would have been a photographer because the photographer and with a very sharp, um, very sharp um, brush stroke, he has a very sharp brush stroke and also very detailed in all his look for example i'm not really talking about the dog but i'm talking about these kind of boots uh, uh, that the person has behind him you see all these little laces these 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 shoelaces uh, are detailed you can see the fabrics so um, that's something that they all did so we are here in the years 1503 1504 uh, 5 so we don't really know when he painted this one but um so i mean that was usual, you know, the, the the care for the details for the fabrics, for example. But he does it really with an unsurpassed uh, detail. Yes, this is again the coat of arms, the papal coat of arms now of this Piccolomini. So there were two Piccolomini popes, you know, incredible, you know, uncle and um, nephew. So Pius II and Pius III. And uh, so... Shall we enter? <laughs> Shall we enter? As I said, if you don't know what is behind these doors, you're just walking around in the cathedral and you go inside. Well, it's really something because this is what you see now since 2020. You know, because since 2020, the restorations, which have lasted some years, were finished and the color, so the original bright for some people, shocking colors, they, you know, they are back again. Now, I'm not really sure this, this um, with photographs, you can change the colors, you can change the intensity and so on. But, um, you know, I was in the library also last week. And um, so, uh, yeah, you know, I try to see it from a perspective when you enter for the first time and you don't know what is behind the door. So that's really something marvelous, something grand. And so this library, so this building has only one entrance so that was that little door so you cannot enter from outside or anything so um you this library was commissioned by this francesco Todeschini. so when he was a cardinal so he was a cardinal cardinal francesco Todeschini piccolomini he commissions his library to make a monument for his family so the piccolomini family you know they they need to leave uh, something to the city of siena they leave they need to leave a kind of um, yeah, a monument also, but it has to be public. You know, the fact that you can only enter from the church means it's it's a public place. So if you, everybody who went to this church could you know could also and then the cathedral you know could enter this library, and it was really intended as a library. So this Piccolomini, so the cardinal and also his uncle, the pope, they had an incredible collection of books. So a lot of, uh, not only religious books, uh, you know, they had a lot of uh, also books, um, um, so um, Latin authors, Greek authors that had been uh, copied. And so um, they had quite, quite a collection. And so he wanted this place to be a library. And um, that was the original intention. And so this is the only, um, the only windows. So you have you know, on, on the back, when you enter, this is what you see in front of you. So you see the uh, the windows, so two windows, and you can see the papal, um, the papal and the cardinal coat of arms. As you can see of the Piccolomini family, you can see it everywhere. You can see it in the windows, in between the windows, on top of the windows. So, and if you, you know, and if you are not sure to, to have seen it on the floor, the floor, this is a beautiful Maiolica floor, probably original. You know, because I haven't told you the date, but so the um, this library was built or perhaps installed in the 1490s. So 
we don't know exactly if if there was already a building that was transformed into this library or um i mean there were there were the apartments of the canons uh, there but so we don't know if it was knocked down and then rebuilt so we don't know and perhaps for us it's not really important but so in the 1490s you know this library is installed in the 1490s also these uh wooden um um, you see these kind of, well, showcases now because there is glass, but so for, you know, to contain the books and to present the books, the, those were ordered. So the whole wooden wooden panels and so on, they were ordered in the 1490s. They have been, you know, really, not really replaced, but they have been redone, you could say, also in the 17th century. And we know that the books that you can see now, uh, those are choral books. So books with the, the psalms and the songs, um, they have been there since the 17th century. So we also don't know if this library was ever, I mean, if, if the books of the collection of the Piccolomini family were ever in this library, we don't know that uh, too. But so um, it was really um, as a uh, seen as a library. And then you have the ceiling. This ceiling is really incredible. So I don't have, a, don't have a good picture of the whole of it, but as you can see, it's, it's gold, it's blue, it's red, and then you have all these, these compartments with little, little scenes. And then in the middle of the library, you see this, you have the three graces. Now, what on earth, you know, we are still in a church. Well, we're not really in a church. Technically, we are not really in the church anymore. But so you have these three graces, where a lot of people found it very, find it very puzzling. Well, we know that this sculpture, so this is a Roman sculpture, so it mean was it's 2,000 years old, and it's a copy of a Greek a sculpture, probably. And so it represents the three graces, so the three daughters of Zeus who brought uh, joy, prosperity, abundance. And so these three graces, um, there were very, I mean, there are several of these Roman sculpture that represented three graces. And you know, we are in Renaissance. So 15th century, 16th century, everybody's really interested uh, in everything. For example, here, look on the right hand side, that is a famous painting by Raphael. It's a tiny painting. It's now in the National Gallery in London. But so you see the painting of Raphael. So the theme of the three graces was something yeah, quite popular. And so what is interesting is that Raphael, he painted this, this little painting uh, in uh, 1502-1503 and 1502 that's when Pintoricchio starts to work in the library we don't know exactly when they put the three graces here this statue in this library so where did Raphael perhaps see a representation did he see a copy in Rome did he see this one in Siena because we also know that Raphael you know, was in Siena at a certain point so that's also interesting to know we don't know where he has where you know if he copied this this one of Siena or another one and then of course so as I said in 1502 we have a signed contract um, between now it's Francesco Todeschini Piccolomini, so still cardinal then, who commissions the paintings, but it's not himself who, 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 who signs the contract. It's, of course, the whole building of the cathedral. And so they sign a contract, so we even know the date, 29th of June, 1502, because the uh, contract is still there. And there are a lot of details in that contract um, that are perhaps interesting to know, because uh, that explains, for, ex for example, the ceiling, why he made a ceiling like that. Now, Pintorique was a painter who was born in Perugia. Perugia is the capital of Umbria. That's, you know, I'm talking to you now from <laughs> Perugia. Um, and so um, he was from Perugia, we had the same same, same age as, for example, Perugino. You know, we talked also about Perugino. And uh, so the same generation, Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, and so on. But Pintoricchio didn't go to Florence as Perugino, for example. You know, he had first um, a workshop in Perugia, but he knew Perugino very well. And so when Perugino in the 1480s was appointed as the master of the whole a painting workshop of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. You know, you know that Perugino, he asked Botticelli, Signorelli, he asked Cosimo Rosselli, and he also asked Pintoricchio to come. 
he also asked Leonardo da Vinci, you know, but Leonardo da Vinci didn't, he didn't go because he said, I'm not really a painter. He didn't consider himself, you know, a painter. He was more like a scientist or something. But Pintoricchio, he goes to Rome. He paints in the Sistine Chapel. And unlike all the other ones who returned to Florence or to somewhere else after they finished the Sistine Chapel, he remains in Rome. That was very clever because, you know, that was an incredible building site. And so all the painters who were involved with the Sistine Chapel, and I'm talking obviously about the walls of the Sistine Chapel and not about the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, who, which was painted more than 25 years later by, uh, by Michelangelo, of course. But so um, Pintoricchio, he remains in Rome. And so immediately he gets commissions from important families. You know, they all want Pintoricchio, one of the painters of the Sistine Chapel. It's of course incredible curriculum. And so Pintoricchio, he, paint, he, he painted uh, a lot in Rome. He painted in the Santa Maria del Popolo, Santa Maria della Racelli. He painted for the Borgia Pope. You know, Alexander VI, the famous and infamous Borgia Pope. You know, he painted the apartments of the Borgia Pope in the Vatican. He painted uh, other rooms for um, the Borgia Pope in Castel Sant'Angelo. I mean, they don't exist anymore. So Pietro Riccio was an incredible, incredible successful painter. And he paint he was known to have a very well organized team he painted very so organized very quickly he always respected his contracts in the sense that you know he always finished on time and um yeah what what, what more do you want you know from a painter so he had a lot a lot of commissions and um you know he was very famous for perugino for example his contemporary and you know, from also from Perugia, um, also had a lot of commissions, but he had so many commissions that I mean, he accepted everything, and so of course he sometimes he couldn't finish uh, it. But so Pintorico was very clever; he was well organized, so he knew exactly what he was doing. And then, if we come back to the ceiling, uh, I have another detail of the ceiling. So it's mentioned in the con in the the contract. Now I have to quote it. So in the contract, it's specifically mentioned. Um, so. In the center of the vault, paint a handsome and splendid coat of arms. And um, the coat of arms, this is a side note, the coats of arms in marble, so you know there are also sculpted coats of arms everywhere, they should be painted, they should be gilt, and they should be made beautiful. You know, when we see these beautiful marble coat of arms, often they were very colored. So here we have a proof of that. The vaulting of this library is to be painted with whatever fantasies, colors, and panels the painter judges to be most appropriate, beautiful, and striking. And in fact, in the style of decor that is now called grotesques, with various compartments as beautifully and imag imaginatively as possible. Now, you see what fantasy, striking, colorful, beautiful. So, um, it, you know, so they wanted something incredible. And uh, so in compartments, you see also different compartments. And so that's what he does. And also a lot of gold and not only a lot of gold, but also um, you see, for example, here in, in, in um, around this little painted panel, you have these um, kind of, well, roses, you could say, uh, they are in stucco. And so these are not painted, they're really in relief. So they, they are in stucco, a lot of gold. And so, um, but, you know, that's what he was asked to do. And that's what he did. You know, you could say, Michelangelo would have said, I'm not doing something that I don't want. But, you know, P Pintoricchio, he, you know, he was very successful for that. And, um, now, um, you know, he had a very good team and so he didn't paint everything himself. And also in the contract, it's also specified that, um, yes, now I, I don't think, I, but I remember that in the contract, it's written that the painter, so Pintoricchio, who signs the contract, he has to paint all the faces personally. So the portraits, the faces, certain details have to be done by him and not by his assistants. So, but in this case, these little panels on the ceiling, they were painted by assistants. So in the middle, you have the, the um, how do you say in English, the rapt or the, the kidnapping of Proserpina by Pluto. And then underneath you have um, 
charity, the lady with the children, it's charity. And on the right hand side, we have peace in this red, uh, yes, red dress. Uh, piece. She has an olive branch and beneath her there are these armors. So, I mean, then we have the seasons. So these little little boys, they represent uh, on the left, it's autumn. On the right hand side, it's winter. So, um, you know, very, but I mean, from below, it's it's a bit hard to see. And here you can see that it was really in stu stucco. So this is part of the, the coat of arms, the many coat of arms. Uh, here you can see the, the head of the cardinal. And so that was in stucco. Uh, so in relief, with, with a lot, a lot of uh, gold that was applied to it. And uh, also another detail is this. Um, this is the grammatica, representation of grammatica, which means the art to read. And so it's not really the grammar as we know today, but the art to read. So the lib one of the liberal arts is also painted on the scene. So you see the ceiling has quite a program. Where, you know, the, we have um, the virtues, we have the seasons, we have uh, the liberal arts. Arts. Uh, we have mythological scenes. But look, if you look on the, uh, the left and the right of this uh, character, here I have another one, you see how, um, how decorative these grotesques are. So you see, it was specifically mentioned in the contract of 1502, grotesque. And they say, uh, the, um, where is it? Um, this in the style of decor that is now called grotesque. You have to know this contract is from 1502. And in 1502, this grotesque style was, was already very fashionable, but, but it was still new. Uh, you know, in, the, in 1480, so, uh, somebody falls into a hole uh, in, um, in Rome near the Colosseum, and that's how they discover the Domus Aurea. So the golden palace of Emperor Nero, 200 rooms that were completely painted. And as you can see, you know, the ceiling, you see the holes are where then, you know, they, the people would come in, you know, to, you know, to explore and to see what, what was in the grotte, because that's what they started to call these underground uh, rooms, the grotte, the caves. And so they started to paint as in the caves, grotesco, grotesco, so grotesque, that's where the word comes from. So this was discovered in 1480, but it was an incredible event. So, you know, 1480, the painters, they all go there, um, you know, to study, to see how the Romans painted. And you see, this is one of the ceilings um, in the Domus Aurea. Uh, you see, typical was, were these panels, so every little panels, and then all these um, meandering decorations. Um, so, so you saw the ceiling that we just saw of uh, Pintoricchio, um, that was, um, yeah, you know, was directly inspired from these Roman grotesque, and the grotesque start to be, you know, really a style as you saw. And so this is, you know, this is a picture of a room in the Domus Aurea they discovered in 2019, so just four years ago. And you see, um, you know, it was completely filled up, you know, uh, it was completely filled up uh, after it was abandoned. And so, um, yeah, you know, they have to dig out all this rubble. Anyway, so yes, this is another, you see, very decorative. The Roman painting is very known for these incredible decorations with a lot of fantasy uh, animals. And so now you understand the ceiling. So it was specifically asked, grotesque style, and also with a lot of colorful, you know, so it was all in the contract. Oh, what did I do? I'm sorry. Okay, and now um, the main walls, I mean, on the walls, we have 10 huge scenes that are 10 episodes of the life of Pope Pius II. Because, of course, this whole library is to celebrate, you know, the life of Pope Pius II. It's a celebration also of the Piccolomini family, you know, the, the achievements of this family. But so the 10 panels on the wall, so there are two on the short wall. So now you're looking towards the entrance. And so the door, the entrance door is just beneath these two central scenes. And then there are four on the left and four on the right. And then the other short wall or small wall is the windows. And okay, so here you can see some of the scenes. Now, before I start to 
explaining the scenes and to tell the story about this Pope, uh, Pintoricchio, so the painter Pintoricchio, so as I said, he had an incredible career. Uh, when he painted this, he was something like 50 years old. We don't know exactly when he was born, but something like 50 years old, a very mature painter, very organized. He had his assistants, and that's what I already said. Um, but he um, was, uh, he is often considered by later artists to be not really the great monster. Um, and that negative comment is all based on um, Giorgio Vasari. You know, Giorgio Vasari, we always have to mention him. Giorgio Vasari was. Um, a painter, sculptor, architect, you know, architect of the Uffizi, for example. He was originally from Arezzo, but he made his career in Florence. And so Giorgio Vasari wrote the book about the greatest uh, artist and the life of the greatest artist. And so he mentions Pinturicchio. And um, from the first sentence, you can you notice that Giorgio Vasari was not a fan of Pinturicchio. And so this negative idea of Vasari just continued, you know, everybody always picks it, you know, you really have to read Vasari with a bit of a critical eye. So he gives a lot of facts, a lot of information. But for example, what does he say about, um, about Pinturicchio? I know that by heart because I always mention it. So, you know, Pinturicchio is one of my favorite painters. So I have to defend him, of course. So Vasari, uh, he says, uh, there are painters who during their life are, um, are um, very unlucky. You know, they never break through because they don't have the opportunity or um, they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. So, um, you know, so they, they are painters that are so talented, but they, they, they are never discovered. So, and, um, you know, that's a pity, of course. And then there are painters who don't have any talent at all, but due to circumstances and luck, they will break through and they will have an incredible career. And so <laughs> according to Vasari, Pinturicchio was one of the latter. So he said, you know, he didn't have any talent, but you know, <laughs> but you have to acknowledge he had a good uh, team, he could work, he was a good businessman. And so Vasari has a very negative idea about him because it's true, Pinturicchio has a bit of different style. Uh, he's not Perugino, he's not Michelangelo, he's not Raphael. Here, Pinturicchio, he was a kind of reporter, you could say. He wants to tell a story with one image. He doesn't want to represent emotions. He doesn't want to represent movement, for example. It's really like images frozen in time. He wants to tell a story with a lot of details. And so, uh, but to say that he didn't have a talent, there is one thing that Pinturicchio, and I'm going to show it now, uh, one thing that Pinturicchio did, which, um, so I just hope it will come across with an image, because if you are there, you see it immediately. I mean, you see it immediately. No, a lot of people, um, let's say, it's ne it's never pointed out. You know, I have seen a lot of presentations or have seen a lot of other things, you know, I, I also follow guided tours and, and other places, but they never point out that um, how good Pinturicchio was in the perspective. Now, look, if you look at these two scenes that you have in front of you, so uh, you look directly at the scene, you see the scene on the left, you see some trees, you see like a column. So afterwards, I will explain what this is about. But just look at this left scene. So you're like really standing in front of it. So the, the, the person who take the, took this photographer, I don't know which lens or something, but the, the, this photographer was standing in front of that scene with the blue sky and with the trees. And look around this, above the scene, you have a painted arch. So I assure you that arch is painted. Uh, and also these columns left and right, of, or the pillars better, the pillars left and right of the arch, they are painted. And um, so you are standing in front of it. Now look to the scene on the right of that. So you can see that's a, a scene inside a church. You can see two windows, you can see a ceiling. So it's an interior of the church. Now look, you see the arches, there's also, um, there's also an arch above that scene. There are also two pillars left and right 
of that. So it's all painted. So that's just one flat wall. Um, but look, the left hand scene, I just hope it comes across the left hand scene, the arch, you see the arch is, is plain. You're really looking directly to that arch. And then you look towards the right hand side scene and then it's as if this scene is, is seen from the left. You see the arch. The arch is not completely symmetrical anymore. It's not completely plain. And then there is a corner and then there is the next wall and there's another scene. So every scene, look, you see, now we are looking at the same two scenes. But now, if you look now at the right-hand side scene, you see with, I mean, of the two in front of us, left is the one with the trees. If you look at the one on the right-hand side, now the arch is a perfect arch. You see, now we are looking at it completely frontally. Instead here, you see how it moves. And that is something that Pinturicchio, you know, it's really incredible how he did that. And when you are standing there, or for example, in, um, Yes, this is, um, this is, yeah, look on the, look now on the left, you see, look at the wall on the right hand side, look at the middle scene, you see with this kind of dark blue ceiling, and you can look through, there is a kind of landscape behind, you see that the art, how the arch is, you see that the arch is like in a foreshortening, but if you're standing in front of the scene, look, the arch is completely normal. Is it's a perfect arch. Instead, if you look at the scene from here, you see how it changes. That's really incredible. When you move through this space, through this building, and and you look towards the arch, that you know your perspective will change, and that's really something incredible. I uh, you see. Oh, here I put them next to each other. You see the scene with the dark ceiling? Yeah, there are different colors. But you see. And so I hope it comes across. I hope that you can see it and it's not because, you know, I know how it looks like live. And look, this is another example. This is another masterpiece of Pinturicchio. It's the chapel in Spello. Spello is in Umbre, the Cappella Baglioni. I will never be able to do a live tour there because it's um, there's no signal. But um, look, here we are now standing. Now, you have really have to sit Complete, really in front of this painting. So move your chair, whatever, sit in front of this painting. You can see the Holy Virgin, you can see the angel in the foreground, and then you have this big arch around the whole scene. You're, and then you're looking through a kind of gallery to a, a landscape outside. And if you look through these, through these, you see like these, there are pillars with three arches. If you look so you are sitting or standing directly in front of it. Now, it, it's, it looks as if you're looking towards the left. You see, if you look through these three arches, it's as if it's, you know, if, you, if you look towards the left. Now, try to move your chair towards the left. Go a little bit further to the left. And now it looks as if you're looking to it from the right. So I hope it comes across like this also. But if you are there, it's really incredible. I mean, that's really a place I like to bring people there because that's really when I can make jaws drop. Because if you don't point it out, you won't, perhaps you won't see it. But if you start to move, the whole thing moves with you. And he achieved that by, for example, making these strange pillars. You see the pillars on the right-hand side, they are not really square. There are these um, kind of... Um, yeah, corners inside, so little indentation. So that's really how we achieve to do that. I mean, just so I'm I'm sorry I lost a little bit of time here, but I, you know, if nobody ever points it out, I think it's important. Okay, this is the view of the library. So um, yeah, so you see the these these the books and left and right, and then you have these ten huge scenes that tell us the story of. Enea Silvio Piccolomini. And look, underneath every scene, there is a text that explains what we are saying. But uh, often, you know, the text is saying much more. For example, this text, now I'm go not going to read the 10 text, but this one, for example, you see that the text on the blue says, Enea Silvio Piccolomini was born to his father Silvio and his mother Vittoria on October the 18th, 
1405 at the family estate of Corsignano. By the way, Corsignano will end up being Pienza. And you know the town of Pienza, a world, UNESCO World Heritage, also considered to be the ideal town. So it was just a simple village Corsignano that Enea Silvio Piccolomini, when he became Pope, pious, he changed the name. So it became Pienza. And then he wanted to transform it into an ideal Renaissance town. And so here we see him as he is hurrying to the council in Basel and he's driven to Libya by a storm. So that is the what we can see here. So this is perhaps, yeah, unfortunately the color, uh, in the meantime, it has been restored, but it's very difficult to find good pictures or clear pictures, but I'm going to show you details just in a second. But here you can already see the whole thing. So you can see Enea Silvio Piccolomini, so the later Pope, Pius II. He is sitting on a horse, on a white horse. Now, white horse were more reserved for important personalities, even for popes. But so he's really in the foreground. And in the background, you can see a storm, uh, you can see a port, you can see some boats, because he was uh, traveling first by boat. So from the port of Siena, he would wanted to go to Genova, and then from Genova overland to Basel in Switzerland. And here you can see the storm. Um, and so they almost had to land in Africa, in Libya, but then luckily the wind changed and they could come back to um, Italy. Um, but so the beginning of the voyage was uh, very bad. Here you can see a detail on the left. Again, you know, Pinturicchio, who was famous for these incredible details. You know, he was a fashion photographer, perhaps. He would have been a fashion photographer because all the details of all the, you know, of the garments, of the hats, of the jewels and the boats. And I mean, and you see the tail of the horse. They're really, really um, incredibly sharp. And um, so here you can see Enea Silvia, who is looking back to us. And um, in reality, he was traveling with a cardinal. But the cardinal here is almost in the background. You can see him on his brown horse, so with the red cap. And um, so um, because Enea Silvio, you know, um, when he went to the council in Basel, he was uh, 25, 25, 26 years old. And um, he... Um, he, he had become the secretary of this cardinal. And uh, so, um, you know, he was born in Corsignano in that little village, but then he was sent to Siena to study. He also studied in Florence. Uh, he became a teacher, a teacher in Siena, because, you know, he could speak, uh, he could, well, he had studied Latin and Greek. You know, uh, everybody studied Latin, but not everybody studied Greek. That was really uh, not common. And so um, he became a teacher. But, you know, probably he was very adventurous. And so he had the opportunity to become a secretary and to travel with this cardinal to um, Switzerland. And um, here you have some other details. And so look at this, this traveling cloak and this kind of fur collar, this hat. Um, and then um, very strange, there is this, this other gray horse with these long ears. <laughs> so when um, you know, somebody said it's an exotic type of, of horse i don't know i don't know a lot about horses uh, but um well it has really long ears <laughs> and um so here we see another gentleman in reality he ha you see he has a kind of red string or red rope because he, he, it's a hunting dog he has a hunting dog uh, beneath him um, and then in the background you see all these different heads there's also a very curious one you see you see there is um, a, a religious man with you know, on the horse with the long ears, with a black hat. Uh, and, and then behind him, you have a very strange hat. It looks almost like an Asian hat. And then somebody who is covered, you know, has covered his, his face. But that's a bit of cu curious um, kind of uh, personnel. Person oh, here, I didn't remember. I had the dog. <laughs> um, so um, also you look at these, these different... Um, you know, these plants, these flowers, very, very detailed. And then this is um, this is probably a representation of Genova. Um, there's some discussion about it, but you know, perhaps it's not really important for us. And then you see how he represents the storm. You know, there's a rainbow on the right-hand side. On the left, you have these very dark clouds. 
and then you have this the, the, the light shining through these dark clouds. Now, um, there is a precedent for this type of representation because look, this is in the Sistine Chapel. This is the parting of the Red Sea uh, painted by Cosimo Rosselli, you know, mm, a bit further, Pinturicchio painted. You no, know? they were painting in the same space in the Sistine Chapel at the same time. And look how Cosimo Rosselli represented the sky and you know the rain. So it could be that he was inspired by that. Uh, you have to know that they all knew each other's works, especially here in the Sistine Chapel. They knew each other's work. They they were inspired by each other. And now I have to show you this. This is a drawing in the Uffizi. So this is in the, in the Uffizi Museum. And um, this is the scene of, you know, what we just saw. It's a bit different because this was uh, drawn by Raphael. So um, everybody nowadays agrees that this is um, an, um, a drawing by Raffaello. And um, everybody agrees that this is the scene that we just talked about because you see there's a text and couldn't I couldn't enlarge it I couldn't find a, a picture of the text you see there's a text above and there that's a description that's a description of you know uh, Enea Silvio Piccolomini uh, and then and then there are some other words but yeah you can't really make them up but there are some other words on the drawing where they say this is the port of Genova and so on so um this is made by Raffaello and so this is clearly a link with the scene we just saw um, this is also, you see how it is cut out, and there is a kind of grid. You see there's a, a drawn grid. So um, this is typical of a carton. So when you see something like this, is a preparatory design for, um, you know, if you have to do wall painting, you first do your sketches and you do your preparatory designs with these grids, you know, then you can make it, you can enlarge it. And it's, of course, um, and very important then, you know, if you want to trans it. So this is, of course, not the, the size of the actual painting, because the actual painting on the wall is huge, and this is, um, is three feet, um, no, two feet, uh, perhaps, uh, high. But, um, so, but it's clearly a link. And so Vasari, Giorgio Vasari, in his uh, writing about the life of Pintoricchio, he says, Pintoricchio painted, you know, the beautiful library, Piccolomini library, but he said the inventor of this, of these paintings of the cycle was Raphael. So Vasari says um, <clears throat> um, that Pintoricchio executed the uh, idea invented by Raphael. And um, this is a big, big discussion that is ongoing. Uh, you know what is the what is the connection of Raphael with the chapel? Now the contract in 1502 was made with Pintoricchio. You know, I mean, he signed the contract, and in 1502 Raphael was 19 years old, but he was already considered a master. He had already his own commissions and. You know, in 1502, he was between Perugia and Città di Caselli, he was in Umbria, he made some incredible things there. But so, um, is it possible that he's not mentioned in the contract at all if he was the inventor of everything? And also, um, you know, Pintoricchio, well, he didn't really need someone else to do this whole idea. You know, in, in the contract, which is so detailed, it's always a contract with with him, with Pintoricchio. So it's always a contract to say, you know, the master, you know, and they mention him by name. So Pintoricchio. So there's no trace of Raphael. And um, yeah, there's a whole discussion going on. So everybody said some, perhaps Pintoricchio, he had also other commissions going on. Even if in the contract it was said, he shouldn't accept any other commissions nowhere else. He should first do the library. Uh, but we know that he didn't respect that he had other commissions going on. But, you know, he delivered on time, so that was okay. But so it could be that he asked Raphael to help him with the preparatory designs. It could be. It could be. And that's what everybody thinks now. Uh, but uh, it's it's a bit of a problem. But everybody says, okay, Raphael collaborated. But, you know, I have some books about frescoes, I mean, about these, these chapels and these commissions and well, anyway, he, Raphael certainly saw the chapel because we have other drawings of him, uh, but they are in um, um, 
the, in the Ashmolem in Oxford, but also one in, in New York. There's also one in the Morgan Library in New York with of another scene. So, I mean, somehow, Raphael, I mean, that's not really uh, clear. But look, in the end, Pinturicchio, he did something quite different. I mean, of course, you see the horse on the foreground and the man who looks back, but the use of space is completely diff different. You can see that the young Raphael, you know, 19 years old, uh, on the left, you see on the drawing, he has an yeah he has an incredible command of the use of space completely different from you know so on the right hand side you see Pinturicchio he wanted to emphasize the storm you know but on the left hand side well you see well, you see there is a difference of course and then we have the next scene the next scene is um, Enea Silvio so um, here again you have the text so perhaps I will just read this one Enea Silvio sent to the king of the Caledonian so Scotland as an ambassador from the Council of Basel, and he's driven towards Norway by a storm and returns to Basel, evading the king's spies by way of England. So you see what is written underneath is not really what is represented. I mean, the storm is not represented. But so what do we see here? Um, oh, yes, well, that's something. So perhaps this is more clear. So um, here we see the king, the king. Uh, James I, King of Scotland, who is sitting on a throne, on a kind of elevated throne. Um, but you see the space behind, you know, this gal uh, sitting on kind of terrace, balcony, loggia, and then you see the whole landscape uh, behind. So this is a very symmetrical uh, work. Now you see also a group on the left, a group on the right-hand side of people. But you see the heads of all the people who are standing, you know, around or behind the king. You know, the heads all have the same height, you know, they're all at the same height, because then, of course, you can see the whole landscape uh, behind. And I have some details. Um, uh, again, here, I very beautifully dressed all the details of the fabrics, for example, but I can't remember which details I have. So here, again, you see this, this, this gentleman uh, on the right hand side or the other one with the head and yeah here a lot of detail so that's what's so um interesting and very sharp you know very sharp uh as i said always very very sharp brush stroke so we don't have these faces um like very vague faces uh, like, like you know as we saw for example before with uh, perugino um <clears throat> And uh, yeah, here we see another, so every detail, every detail is um, well represented. So here you see on the book, I mean, he could also have left these, these kind of golden <laughs> decorations, you know, but, but he put them. And then you can see he is not really have, uh, wearing a belt, but he has a white piece of fabric with these um, embroideries. And that's a typical, this is a typical textile from Perugia. So he, he represented several times in his work. So that was the kind of style from Perugia, um, this textile. So that's, um, uh, so in, I said embroidered, but in reality, it's not, it's woven. So it's really woven. So white with these blue, uh, with these blue patterns. Here again, even, you know, um, the hair coming out from under his cap and then the, the eyebrows, brows, so, um, well, we're saying the golden dots that you can see, they were put on. So this is not fresco technique. Of course, that was painted later on in the contract. It stated that he has to paint in fresco and then he has to um, do some, um, they say, miglioramenti. So make it better with tempera. So, you know, if there is something to highlight or something wrong, he has to paint it and dry. And then he can also use this gold, you know, these. Um, applications of gold or of stucco, so in in re re relief. Here you can see the beautiful landscape. Oh, those beautiful landscapes of um, Pintoricchio, and they are typical Umbrian landscape, or I mean, from the Umbrian school. Um, you know, from the Middle Ages on, you have the uh, painting school from Florence. You have the painting school from Siena. But then from Renaissance on, we'll also have the Umbrian painting school. And with painting school, you don't, I don't mean a building where you would go to school. No, it's, it's a kind of style. So, and that starts with Perugino and Pintoricchio. As I said, they were both from the same generation. So from the end of the 15th century, we have 
those two important painters who have their workshop, their assistants, a lot of commissions. And so often their assistants or their stable you know, assistants, they also have commissions, they also have an own workshop. And so this, all these people surrounding Perugino and Pinturicchio, they are part of what we call the Umbrian school. So you could say the Umbrian uh, painting style. And um, so what you always have is this landscape with the kind of olive green um, hills. Then on the left hand side, you see this typical rock. I don't know, do I have a detail? Yes. So um, this kind of rock party that even Leonardo da Vinci is going to use, but some um, these kind of bit strange rocks for us. Uh, always a water, water. So, um, you know, uh, Umbria has the Tiber River. So not only Rome, but Umbria has a type of river as well. It also has one of the biggest lakes of Italy. So there is a water. And then, um, yeah, so the, and then the leaves of the trees, they're almost represented leaf by leaf. So very, very stylized and very detailed. And here, oh, yes, I have the detail. No. Okay. Now, why on earth did um, Enea Silvio Piccolomini go to Scotland? Well, so the, um, the background is this. So we saw on the first scene that Enea Silvio became a secretary of a cardinal and the cardinal was heading to Basel. Now, what was happening in Basel? Well, in Basel, there was a council, a papal council. And that council in Basel had been, had started or had been um, called for by Pope Martin V. And Pope Martin V, he was the Pope who put an end to the great Western schism, or sh I really don't know in English how to pronounce this, but you know that, you know, for a while uh, in the 14th century, the popes, they went to Avignon. So they went to Avignon. Uh, why? That's too long to explain. But so they were, were gone. And then uh, after 70 years, one Pope goes, I mean, the Pope goes back to Rome. And when he dies, there is a new pope elected in Rome, but the cardinals in Avignon didn't agree. They say, no, 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 you know, we are going to appoint, you know, our pope. And so, you know, that for a while there were two popes. There was a pope in Rome and there was a pope in Avignon. And that's what they call the Great Western Schism. <laughs> the, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I I really don't know how to pronounce it. So you will tell me afterwards. But so here you can see um, how Europe was divided in those days. You know, also England, Scotland, they were all Catholic. And so you can see that in, the, in Scotland, they were um, supporting, you know, the side of Avignon, the Pope in Avignon. And then, for example, England was supporting the Pope in Rome. So that's, of course, interesting. And then the, the orange one there in Germany, they, they switched sides several times. But so this great schism was ended by Pope Martin V in 1417. Or better, no, so um, he was a result of the end. So um, in 1417, there was the big, big council of Constance. And there this council decided, OK, we are going to get rid of the Pope in Avignon, get rid of Pope in Rome, so we will appoint a new Pope, and that was Martin V. And so Martin V, he was then, you know, um, because first they had said, okay, let's, <laughs> let's, and there is a time when there were even three Popes, but I mean, okay, now uh, that's not really relevant then for, um, for our case now. But so you see, Pope Martin V, he became the new pope, but, you know, the council had said, okay, Martin V becomes a new pope, but we're going to get rid of this um, supremacy of the pope so that the pope can decide everything himself. No, we are going to say that the council, uh, the council has a voice too, and even has a more important voice than the pope. Even the pope has to listen to the council, so to the reunion of all the bishops. And so the council will get his... Uh, um, inspiration directly from God. And so Martin V was obliged then to, you know, every now and then he had to um, organize this council. So when there were problems, he couldn't decide anything without the council. And so he organized a council in Basel. There were a lot of problems, but Let's uh, well, let's not talk about that. But so he mm, organized a council in Basel. But uh, I mean, almost nobody turns up, and then he dies, and then Eugene 
Eugene the Fort, he says, okay, now let's get serious. Let's go to Basel. And so he starts with this council in Basel, but um, in Basel, and I'm telling you that because the next scenes are relevant for that. So in Basel, um, in Basel, they, um, 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 in so in Babel, Basel, so Pope Eugene the Fort, he says, um, uh, I don't accept the fact that the council has more power than me. And uh, so he said, okay, let's get away from Basel. And so he moved the council to Ferrara and then eventually to Florence. In the meantime, there were a lot of new political issues also with the, you know, with the, um, the, the Oriental Church and Constantinople, which was menaced, um, you know, was threatened by the Turks and eventually fell in 15, uh, 1453. But so here the council in Basel had the effect that so the Pope went away, but part of the council remained in Basel and they said, okay, we are going to appoint our Pope. You see, again, we have the situation of the two Popes. So for 10 years, again, there will be two popes. I mean, what really a very chaotic situation. Now, uh, our Enea Silvio Piccolomini, who had arrived in Basel just as a simple secretary of a cardinal, he immediately sees here we have some interesting people at the council and, um, uh, you know, a lot of important people. And so he, well, he, he, he quit his job as, as a simple secretary of the cardinal. And so he became secretary of some more important people who started to travel. And also he was, um, you know, favorable for this, you know, the party of the councillorists. So against the Pope Eugene the Fort. So, and he, um, so in one of his embassies and as a diplomat, and as a secretary of diplomats, he arrives in Germany in Frankfurt. And this is the next scene. So here you can see Enea Silvio, who is crowned poet by Frederick III. And Frederick III was then the king of Germany. He will become the emperor, you know, the Roman emperor. Um, no. Um, this is perhaps, so here you can see, it's on the foreground again, you can see this kneeling person in red, that is Enea Silvio, he is still, you know, he hasn't got, he hasn't started with his religious career, and so he is crowned poet by, um, well, by the emperor, he will become emperor Frederick III. Now, as you can see, this scene is very familiar from the composition, because this scene was um, inspired by a model, no, and the model is this one. This is the famous, I mean, already shown it several times, I think, uh, during these presentations, but the model was this one. The model is um, here, um, Perugino. Perugino, who um, um, painted this, uh, Jesus handing the keys to St. Peter in the Sistine Chapel, so on the walls of the Sistine Chapel. And um, so this was the first time he created this type of representation. So you see on the foreground, we have the scene. Then on the background, we have these buildings, you know, and like antique buildings. And then in the middle, you have this vast terrace, this vast square, empty space with little groups of persons that are minding their own businesses. And so this will become a model taken over by so many other painters. We saw it with Signorelli, we saw it with, you know, Raphael. So, um, yeah, so this is an important model. And so you can see, this is the same kind of construction. So in the background, you have this building with, you know, where you can look through. And then on the foreground, you have the scene. But, you know, there are groups of people, you see, that are just minding their own businesses. So here you can see is crowning a poet. Why is he crowned a poet? Well, you can see some books here on the steps. Well, you know, Enea um, you know, Silvio, he was not only secretary and diplomat, he was also an a, a author. So he was a poet and he wrote this. So, I mean, he wrote other things, but he wrote De Duobus Amantibus, The Tale of Two Lovers. Now, The Tale of Two Lovers um, is quite an erotic kind of novel. Um, so, um, um, 
I mean, to write something like that, he had to have direct experience. Now, he wasn't married, but he wasn't a religious. And so we know that he had an illegitimate child in Scotland and one in France, for example. I mean, he knew what he was talking about, the Dubus Amantibus. And so now you can find it. There's a balcony scene. You know, there is a balcony scene. And we are talking before Shakespeare. So there's a balcony scene. Same kind of situation, two lovers and desperate and well. Um, so um, here we can see this building, a bit inspired, a classical building. But I see that time is running. Oh, my. I don't know where time is going. But um, anyway, so here you have some scenes. You see, again, very colorful, all these details, even little bags. You have um, um, wallets, you know, little yeah, purses. And... Yeah, he, he did it before, so in Spello again. So this is a fresco in Spello where you can see, again, the same kind of structure. So with this vast space and then, oh, classical background. And then, so uh, in Silvio, he spends some years uh, with Frederick III, um, with, uh, you know, he's still not crowned emperor yet, but um, in Vienna. He will write a lot. But then in Vienna, he has a kind of spiritual crisis. And so um, uh, at one point, he is sent to Rome as an ambassador. And there he um, kneels in front of Pope Eugene IV. And so he, he, he asks pardon because he says, you know, I supported the wrong uh, party. And so, um, you know, and then he becomes, from then on, he becomes a really strong supporter of this papal supremacy. And um, then he goes back to Vienna, he will become a priest, and then he will have an incredible quick uh, career. Uh, I like here, you can see him kneeling, you can see the slippers of the Pope, so <laughs> I like that little detail. But so, um, but you see very narrative, so, you know, these frescoes, they were made to tell the story of this Pope, and so that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> and then uh, in Yosivio has an incredible career, so he becomes Bishop of Siena. And um, so here we can see how, um, you know, the, as a bishop, he presents Eleonora of Portugal to Frederick III because, you know, there was this arranged marriage. And look, this is a, a picture of a very famous spot in Siena where you can have, you see this incredible panorama. And um, wait, oh, um, I'm sorry. And But here on the painting, is, oh, I didn't have a detail, but so you can see this on the background. That's, that's what it shows. And then you can see this column in the middle and then one of the town gates because we know that the meeting between Frederick III and uh, Eleonora of Portugal happened just outside the Porta Camolia. So that was the northern, still is the northern town gate of Siena. And this column is actually there. You see, this column to remember this. So it's already painted there. So this was painted 50 years after the actual meeting. Mm. And here you can see some details, some, you see in the person uh, with, with the black coat and the Maltese cross, uh, that was Alberto Aringeri. He was um, like the, the head of the, the whole um, building site of the cathedral. And then the other one in black is the brother, so the other nephew of Pope Pius II. So the other nephew of Ineo Silvio, so the brother of Francesco Todeschini Piccolomini, because when Francesco died in 1503, um, you know, the library wasn't finished. I mean, it was, the paintings were not finished. And so he had to, um, um, what do you say? He had to, um, um, you know, his, his, his brother had to continue the payments and then the brother died and then his uh, wife you see the other i have a detail thing you see this lady uh, on the right hand side of eleonora because here you can see frederick iii and um um you know frederick iii eleonora you can see the bishop and you can see um the the wife but look here again, you know, all the details of the embroideries, um, the jewelry of the bishop. And I was just checking something because I'm really over time and I don't want. Oh, it's ended. Oh. 
Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because I don't know if I'm, if I'm still there. Because I was just checking because, um, okay, let me open the chat so that I can see if it's, if it's, okay, so I'm opening the chat, but so I don't know if, if, if it, is it still ongoing or not? Because I just had I just had this message not checking, I just had this message that the tour has ended. And um, so I was just checking if because perhaps there is somebody else. I don't know. Was there another tour on the same time? Oh my goodness. No, of course my phone doesn't work. So um yeah, it doesn't work. I'm blocked. So, um, okay, you can still see me, but I wouldn't, I don't know if there's, okay, let me just, um, I'm still there. I just want to see if there is another, there's nothing working here. Okay, world virtual. I'm sorry, but um, I don't want to overlap with another colleague. But... I was just, I'm just checking. I don't, I know that now you can't see anything. I'm just checking if there is somebody else. Um, I'm sorry. Let me see. No, there is nothing. On. Okay. So I don't know why I had this message. So, oh, okay. Oh, there's another tour from 10. Okay, then I really can't. Okay, then I have to stop. That's probably why. Oh, I'm so sorry that I didn't, I don't know where I, where I lost time. <laughs> but so, um, yeah, this is the canonization of Catherine of Siena. And I'm sorry that I didn't um, finish, but I will be in December, I will be in Gubbio. I will be in Assisi. I apologize. I didn't realize. I had should have checked if there was another tour, but on the website, I don't see it on the website. So um, I don't know. Mm, oh, perhaps it's okay. Well, I hope you had a little impression. I hope. Yes, tomorrow, but now I can't see where when there is one now. But um, you see, my phone is not working. I don't have a signal. Um, okay, so um, Yes, I think so. So that I, I don't know if there is a free again. Okay, so um, because I really don't like to to stop like this. So I was also seeing if they are calling me to stop. So I'm not really sure. But so um, yeah. Well, you know, um, there are many details. Oh, when... so in the end, I hope you had a little impression. I like Pintorik a lot because it's so such a, a narrative painter. So he tells the stories. You know, somebody said uh, that painters, they tell us poems, they tell us stories with images. And writers or poets, they paint, or they, 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 they tell us paintings with words. So I like that kind of representation. And so, um, yeah, this was a canonization of Catherine of Siena. And the last scene is, um, you know, our poor Pius II, he was Pope for six years um but he achieved quite something and so he absolutely wanted to organize a crusade uh you know to help constantinople and so here you see him in the port of ancona 
uh, waiting for the Venetian fleet, but that's where he dies. So that's where he dies, and the crusade in the end never happened. And so that is our Enea Silvia Piccolo. I, mean, I think I should do a talk only about the life of Enea Silvia without the paintings. And so, um, yeah, if you liked it, of course, this is, um, yeah, this is what we do also for our living. So thank you already for joining me. I will be Christmas, it will be a Christmas tour in Gubbio, a Christmas tour in Assisi. So um, this was a free academy. You can see it on YouTube. And so if there was uh, questions, so, um, um, So, um, okay, so then I will stop because otherwise, if there is really another tour, then somebody, okay. So, um, thank you very much. Um, keep posted in January, I will be back. And um, yeah, so I'm really sorry. Uh, I went over time, but I can't, you know, I can't take the time now. So thank you very much again. Hope to see you soon again. Bye. Bye, everybody.